CNV is good here, and welcome back to Umi Neko Nonaku Koroni. Your making our way through episode two. And as a refresher, um, so Shannon just realized that she has fallen in love with George and ended up encountering Beatrice, who told her that if she were to break the mirror on the uh, shrine, on the little rock outcropping, she would basically eliminate any and all barriers uh, keeping her from uh, seeing her love reach fruition because I um, basically guaranteed her that without her magic there is no way her and George will ever be together because the arranged marriage that Ava and Hideyoshi have uh, are making for him it's basically the, the most possible suited girl for him so uh, and Shannon very bravely told her no but Beatrice was like oh well you know think about it and Cannon was like fuck off like because <laughs> he hates her for some reason um but yeah so it's romance is in the air for these guys I was getting a little sneak peek into life here on the island uh, when it's not the family conference. What? What do you mean separate rooms? So wait, you and George Nissan stayed in different rooms on purpose? Y yes. Um, is it really so strange? Jessica's cheeks had been stuffed with a chocolate-coated chinsuko biscuit that Shannon had brought as a present from Okinawa, and it all came flying out at Shannon when Jessica cried out. What is a chinsuko biscuit? I'm gonna look that up really quick, because that sounds kind of good. Let's see. Google chinsuko... It's like a little... It's just like a little cookie! Ew, a biscuit cookie. I've never had one, so this is like... <laughs> Learn new things every day. Sh shit! Ooh, oh, that sounds even better. Oh, I love shortbread cookies. Mm. Sh Shannon, why did you even go on a trip to Okinawa? You were even alone with George Nissan. Well, um, he said there was a huge aquarium in Okinawa and invited me to go. And I like fish and stuff. No, that's not the point! We're talking about a healthy guy and girl going on an overnight trip, right? And you're saying there weren't even any hugs and kisses? And seriously, what's up with the guy and girl staying in different rooms? As for k kisses, no comment. Uh, but we did hug. George's son's chest was warm. It's interesting, like, just how... In, like, anime and stuff, like, how shy they portray people as. I don't know if that's, like, just, like, a cultural thing. Or if it's just in that medium. Um... Altogether, but it, it's just something that I've noticed like now that I'm older like Like it's always like oh my goodness the it's so scandalous kissing the person you like kind of thing like But over here. We're just like oh, let's just make out in front of everybody like <laughs> Like whatever <laughs> That's not the point ah jeez. Why do couples like this exist? Ah, jeez! 
I can't take it anymore. From Shannon's point of view, it was an incredibly happy trip for various reasons, but it looked like Jessica found their pace to be pretty irritating. Okay, Jessica gets it, like... <laughs> For a while, Jessica chewed her present, complaining about romance and pretending to faint in agony on her bed. Shannon and George had chosen to go to Okinawa because there was a huge aquarium there. They did this because an aquarium had given them the opportunity to start going out. Since the relationship had started at an aquarium, having their first overnight trip also be to an aquarium must have held some commemorative value. Oh, okay, so this is like... Okay, so some time has passed here. Okay, I get it. Alright. It's like a huge commemorative turning point! And your first overnight trip! How could you not make all kinds of progress there? But instead, you both got separate rooms? A couple taking two single rooms? <laughs> ah, geez, seriously, what's wrong with you? Uh, um, but we are both unmarried. George Sun says showing restraint is good manners for a couple. Like I said, the whole point of this overnight trip was so you could overcome that stage, right? You should be way beyond just kissing and hugging by now. M Milady, I don't know what you mean by that, but, but George Sama was a real gentleman with me until the end. That is, I mean, I also wondered if those things would happen, you know. But even though we are going out, I, I mean, it's not like we're married or anything. These things you seem to be expecting, um, should only be done before making a vow before God. Um, uh, uh, and, oh. Shannon's face got bright red. She made a circle with both hands, restlessly intertwining, separating, and making heart marks with them. Apparently, the dramatic progress Jessica had looked forward to hadn't happened, but it seemed to have been a very important experience for Shannon in her own way. In the end, whether Jessica was jealous of Shannon or made fun of her, it didn't change the fact that Shannon had a huge lead on her. Oh, I want a boyfriend too! I can't believe you got ahead of me! Even though we promised that we'd find boyfriends at the same time you beat me! Ah! You can't make a promise like that, bro. Like... <laughs> Um, you're a wonderful person, milady, so I'm sure you'll find someone wonderful much quicker than me. Don't try to console me! Shannon, you traitor! Get out! Shut up! <laughs> Jessica threw several cushions at her, but midway she had an asthma attack and started to choke pretty badly. Shannon hurriedly ran over to a nearby side table and started searching around on top of it. A cute basket was placed there, and inside of it was Jessica's roncata later. Roncata later? I can't remember how to pronounce it anymore. Inhaler! Can we just call it an inhaler, please? Shannon picked it up and handed it over to Jessica. Jessica's asthma attacks always came suddenly. Because of that, she always needed to carry this medicine around. She breathed in the medicine and, after a while, managed to overcome her choking as her asthma finally settled down. Shannon thought this a good chance to leave and tried to exit the room after bowing courteously. As she did, one more small cushion came flying and hit Shannon on the head. She noticed that Jessica was on the verge of crying, having her face buried in her last and favorite cushion. Oh, dude, I remember this age. Like, it, uh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The face was red and meek. M Milady? Sh Shannon, be honest with me. Is my. here doing stuff weird? What are you saying? I think your hair is very beautiful. Then. Then, then are my eyes strange, or maybe my nose? Or is it the way I talk after all? Is that why I can't get a boyfriend? Of course oh. not. Oh, Jessica, you're fine just the way you are. The lady, you are wonderful enough as you are. 
and I think your charm will keep on increasing more and more from now on. But I'm the only one who can't find a boyfriend. Sako and Hina manage to get boyfriends, but only I can't. Is it because I don't have any charm after all? You know, everyone says they'll bring their boyfriends to the cultural festival. And I was so sure I'd have a boyfriend before then, so I started bragging. There's no way I'll get a boyfriend. I'm... I'm the only one. Before she realized it, Jessica was shedding huge tears. Oh, baby. Jessica didn't really feel like crying, and of course she felt like supporting Shannon's progress and love as a friend. However, as she had cheered Shannon on, her true feelings had suddenly gotten mixed in, and she couldn't help but shed tears. Shannon understood Jessica's innocent and easily injured heart. The rough style of speech Jessica usually used it was all just an attempt to protect that fragile heart. As a daughter and successor to the Ushiromiya family, and as a girl isolated on Rock and Jima, the only person she could expose her true feelings to was Shannon. Shannon understood that. So, she strongly regretted acting smug, even if it was only a little. So sorry. Oh, so sad. Oh, she's so sad. Ah. I'm so weird crying like this. Sorry. You are a wonderful person, lady. Oops. There's no way you won't find a wonderful man. Sh Shannon, it's about time, right? If you don't go quickly again, she said the mom will get mad. I'm just fine, so hurry up. <laughs> Sorry for crying like this. Uh, I'm such a moron. Jessica faced away, acting as though she didn't really want to trouble Shannon, waving her hand as though chasing Shannon away. Shannon took that as a sign that Jessica didn't want to be bothered anymore, bowed her head, and left the room. Someone give this girl a hug! When Shannon's footsteps disappeared into the distance, Jessica lay down on her bed, still hugging a cushion. Her expression was still a little meek, with tears in her eyes. But for the first time in a long time, she had a very, very quiet and honest conversation with her heart. I also want to fall in love. Ah, teenage angst. I don't miss it. Do not miss it. Ugh. As Shannon happily watered the flower beds in the garden, she sensed someone's presence. She turned around, thinking that if one of the family had come to visit, she must greet them. But what she saw was that witch. But Beatrice Sama... It's been quite some time. How are you? Has your relationship with the one you love progressed since last we met? As Beatrice sat on the rose arch, she happily blew on her pipe. Sitting in a place like that would crush the roses, and it might have been dangerous if the arch fell over. But this was a witch after all. Showing concern for her safety was probably a waste of time. Y yes thanks to you, it's going smoothly. Naturally. The effects of my magic are immediate. Perhaps you feel your meeting was a predetermined fate. However, that is a mistake. Don't even think fate has anything to do with it. Uh, I understand that. The witch was calling attention to something. Two things, actually. First, that Shannon's relationship with George was a fate that would be absolutely impossible under normal circumstances. Second, that the power of the witch was great enough to overturn that fact. Shannon had just gotten wrapped up in those sweet days, and had started believing the illusion that all fate revolved around her. But she remembered the witch's words. Originally, her relationship with George had been impossible. No, it might be impossible in the future as well. <laughs> Sorry, please forgive me. It's just like doctors. You cling to them when you're worried about your health, but after you're healed, you forget even to thank them. I've never been thanked as a witch, so I couldn't help acting a little rudely. Oops. Forgive me. The, the gratitude I feel has never slipped my mind. 
It's thanks to your power that I was able to achieve happiness, Beatrice Sama. And without that power, the fate that brought me and George Sama together would never have happened. I have never forgotten that. Sorry, sorry. It's not like I came here to bully you. Being rude is just part of my personality. Do forgive me. More importantly, I heard, I heard. So you went on a trip alone with him. I imagine it must have been quite fun. Y yes it was very, um, fun. Shannon's face suddenly lit up. The witch laughed lightly as though amused by the speed of that transformation. Already, the one you care for is more than the object of one side of love. You are a pair of lovers now. When two people are filled with love, nothing else is needed to establish a complete world. Perhaps you could call that a wonderful, ideal world. <laughs> Even witches would be jealous. Beatrice laughed pleasantly. That smile made her look as though she blessed the lover's rendezvous from the bottom of her heart, without a trace of malice. After that day, Beatrice had shown herself before Shannon every once in a while. Even now, Shannon thought of her as an unsettling being. However, she was also indebted to this person for the magic that led to her current relationship with George. So Shannon tried with all her might not to act surprised or scared. That's right. Um, Beatrice-sama, I bought some sweets as a souvenir from our trip. Would you, um, like to try some too? Oh? A souvenir for a witch? It seemed that even a witch who boasted of living for 1,000 years hadn't imagined that she'd receive a souvenir from a sweet lover's trip. When she saw that surprised expression, Shannon thought of this witch as a friend for the first time. Ho oh, ho! An eastern cookie made from wheat flour and lard. To wrap that in western chocolate is truly a blending of the Japanese and western styles. A silk road of sweets. What? What's so funny? N nothing My apologies. This witch, who surely held a terrifying power, was chomping down on sweets one after another and making it sound like a squirrel stuffing walnuts into its mouth. After a while, Shannon couldn't conceal her laughter. Hmm, a good meal. I should serve you some Dolce Vita from Nero one of these days. Roses are the symbol of eternal love. I believe a rose Dolce would be appropriate for you now. The witch was in a great mood, fully enjoying modern candy. Um, here. I truly am grateful. I believe you've done more than enough for me already, so I'm returning this. The thing Shannon had softly set on the table was a gold-colored butterfly brooch. There's no need to return it. If you continue holding that, your relationship should remain firm in perpetuity. Maybe it was the power of magic that brought us together. But I think only the two of us working together could turn that into something that lasts forever. Mm. Love and roses are the same. Too much fertilizer causes the roots to rot. Some flowers cannot be raised without hard work. In that case, do as you wish. You may wear it or keep it in a box. That is my goodwill given to you. Having you return it to me won't please me at all. Ah, uh, my apologies. That's not what I... <laughs> no harm has been done. That brooch is already yours. If you treasure that proof of our friendship, it would indeed bring me some comfort. You may hold on to it and gain its benefits, or you may keep it in a box. If you wish, you may even give it to another who is worrying about love. Or you could simply treasure it. Of course, it would pain my heart if you wasted it. According to Beatrice, she had appeared several times in the past in response to a person's summons to give them some tool imbued with magical power. However, when most people used that power to resolve their worries, they quickly grew unsettled by it, forgot their former gratitude, and threw away the tools they had been given with disgust. So, it is quite rare for me to be thanked for my goodwill. In fact, this might be... this might even be the first time. <laughs> the witch laughed heartily, but it looked like a sad laugh in Shadon's eyes. She herself had been like that in the past. No, maybe she was still like that now. 
Beatrice was definitely a witch, with a strange and terrifying power. Most people probably wouldn't want to stick around her if they could help it. Surely, even those who had relied on that strange power sometimes felt fear rather than gratitude as a result. It must have deeply hurt the witch to have that happen over and over. Since the time she had started thinking that way, Shannon had tried to stop being frightened of Beatrice. This was surely something that had tormented the witch for over a thousand years. Maybe she really liked those sweets. Beatrice, who normally spoke abusively, praised the black tea that Shannon served her and looked to be in remarkably high spirits. After doing that for a while, the witch and the servant grew animated in their discussion of the trip with George. The things Shannon actually knew about Beatrice were surprisingly few. First off, she was a ghost-like being who appeared in unexpected places at unexpected times, and it seemed that not everyone could perceive that she was there. Apparently, everyone has something called a wavelength, and the ability to perceive witches varies greatly among different people. Only Shannon and Cannon could interact with her enough to exchange words like this. There were a few people who could sense her presence, but most people couldn't even feel that much. Ah, Genji's probably one of those where he can sense her, but he can't see her, though. From what Beatrice said, Kraus and his wife in particular had zero magical talent, and no matter how much she followed them around, they would never notice her. Once earlier, when Shannon messed up and Natsuhi got really mad at her, Beatrice had started playing around, hitting Natsuhi on the head with her pipe. I see, Natsuhi really doesn't notice a thing. But Shannon, watching that, had burst out laughing without thinking, and had gotten scolded even more. Then, what about the master? I hear he's been doing research in magic, so I'm sure he'll be able to notice you, Beatrice-sama. Oh, here we go. Here's some tea right here. Kinzo is the same. He also has a pitiful lack of magical talent. It's the blood. He has so little talent that I pity him. As soon as they started talking about Kinzo, it felt like the atmosphere around Beatrice changed. She had spoken about Kraus and the rest's lack of magical talent as though she looked down on them, but she spoke of Kinzo in a different way. Anyone connected to the Ushiramiya family would know about Kinzo's legend of the gold. According to that, Kinzo was given the gold after summoning the witch, Beatrice. In other words, she must have had some kind of relationship with Kinzo. That was because he succeeded, despite having not even a scrap of talent. He kept studying by himself like mad and managed to become a magician. And that's... something really incredible, right? Indeed! The witch who usually looked down on people was uncharacteristically offering her praise. While she lambasted him by saying he had no talent, she praised his efforts. And then... the master summoned Beatrice Saba with the power of magic. Indeed. Well, I only answered the summons on a whim. After all, in this period where magic has long been denied, here was a man who was without a scrap of talent and so desperate to succeed. I thought I'd drop by and poke some fun at him, and that's when my luck ran out. <laughs> her choice of words highlighted how much of a disaster this had been for her. Shannon hesitated over whether it would be safe to continue this discussion, but Beatrice continued on her own, ignoring Shannon. After all, his contract did have a proper format and set of rules. Various procedures were mixed up, but... Well, in deference to his enthusiasm, I graciously accepted it. Then, I gave him a mountain of gold. And then the master used that gold and succeeded in his business, and grew his wealth into what it is today. Indeed. His talent in magic was minimal, but it seems he had a knack for business and gambling. Or perhaps it was due to the bravery and madness that led him to risk everything on unreasonable bets. Madness sometimes acts as magical power. I see if you look at it that way, perhaps it isn't quite fair to say he was completely lacking in magical talent. <laughs> Shannon felt like she was daydreaming. While everyone in the Shiromiya family knew the story of how Kinzo idolized black magic, summoned a witch, and received the gold, 
In actuality, it was all rambling that no one believed in. And now, Shannon was having the story confirmed by the witch herself. She felt a little flustered by this incredible secret that only she knew. Once Kinzo gained his vast fortune, he could realize every dream that can be satisfied by objects obtainable in the human world. And in the end, he searched for the truth of this world. The truth of this world? The single element that makes up the world. Kinzo, who had gained everything one can obtain in the human world, searched for that. The final desire humans seek. The single element. She seemed to remember the witch using that word before. When Beatrice saw Shannon try to remember what that was, she laughed bitterly, waving her hand and saying there was no need to worry. What do you think the single element is? <laughs> huh? No. And that'll be the question I pose for people to answer in the comments, if they ever do. <laughs> um, I, I know what the single element is, but I had a suspicion about it when I first read it, and I was right. I, was uh, say, I, I get the feeling it was mentioned somewhere, and I just, I can't remember where. Yeah, they, uh, Ryukishi, the guy that wrote this, he does that a lot. He'll mention something, and then, like, way later on, he'll come back to it, and he'll be like, oh, this thing, but it won't say exactly what it is, and so you have to, like, rack your brain trying to remember, like... <laughs> I underestimated Kinzo just a tad. I truly didn't expect him to display such power. And thanks to that, I'm in this state. I've been sewn in place on this island for several decades now, without even a friend to drink tea with. No matter whom I try to talk to, my voice doesn't reach them, and no matter where I go, I cannot do anything. Such boring decades. As she laughed in self-derision, she tapped her teacup with her finger. It made the light sound of pottery. Shannon didn't know whether the word self-derision was really an accurate expression to describe the look on the witch's face. Shannon didn't understand everything, but she could more or less figure out the situation. And it was probably a topic that she couldn't press the witch on easily, not unless the witch started talking about it herself. To sum up everything she had said up until now, Beatrice, who had been summoned by Kinzo's magic, could not leave this island for some reason and she had lost her power and her form, living her days in boredom. During that time, her words had reached Shannon, who never forgot to show sincere respect for the witch. And Shannon had helped the witch regain her power, if only a little bit. As a result, it was now possible for the witch to drink tea with Shannon like this. Oh. Beachisama, what in the world was that mirror you told me to break? Ah, uh, that... A lot ago, it seems various things happened on the islands around this area. Because of that, malignant forces gathered here and began to draw in an evil distortion. It seems a traveling eastern magician or something built a shrine for the repose of souls and sealed them in there. That in itself has nothing to do with me, but unfortunately, the magical power rested on a different foundation than mine. It created a strong interference with my magic, and was extremely bothersome. Is that how it was? And I just assumed it existed only to steal you, Beatrice Sama. I was not its target. But it was a divine mirror. As a result, my power was sealed away. To use food as an example, maybe it would go something like this. Let's say the western food I ordered is being made in the kitchen. However, when they try to set the table, the area for the guest seating is in the Japanese style, with Japanese style dishes. So, the kitchen is unable to serve a plate that would be out of place, and no matter how long I wait, my western food won't arrive. Something like that. 
So, you destroy that Japanese-style guest seating and return the area to a blank sleep for a time. Thanks to that, the meal I had ordered was finally delivered and my power came back, you could say. However, so far, only the aperitif has arrived. It will still be quite some time before the main dish. I probably pronounced that completely wrong, like... <laughs> I, I wouldn't know how. <laughs> it's like French or something, I don't know. Oh. I'm assuming she means appetizer, I guess. Oh, wait, or would that be hors d'oeuvres? Is that the French for appetizer? I don't fucking know. Like, I, I'm horrible at French. <laughs> I took French, like, one semester, and I didn't enjoy it as much as I like German. German was fun. German is, like, one of those languages that, honestly, once you start to learn it, it makes a shit ton of sense. It's extremely logical, which is why I liked it so much. I was like, wow, like, this is easy. Like, <laughs> I can't remember any of it, but I remember kaput. Okay, I guess I remember some words, but I could not say a sentence to save my life. As I am now, I'm even more fragile than a shoe store fairy. <laughs> no. What's so amusing? Nothing. I just thought your metaphor was pretty funny. I never would have thought to use a story about food as a metaphor for magic. I thought it a rather skillful comparison, but I certainly didn't expect it to be laughed at. I'm a bit offended. A slightly sulky expression rose to the witch's face. It wasn't a strange expression at all to be appearing on the face of some friends as they enjoyed their tea. Although I may not look it, I was known for doing extremely br brutal things in the past. I've gotten soft. Now I can't even have a foolish discussion while drinking tea with a human. She was probably talking to herself. As Beatrice gazed at the seabirds chasing the horizon, she put her tea to her lips again. Uh... This is probably, yeah, Beatrice. Except that Shannon's gonna talk about the it looks blue thing. Okay. The clouds have come out. When the ocean loses its brilliance, it's nothing more than a gray puddle. You think so? I think the ocean is a beautiful deep blue, even when it gets cloudy. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe the witch noticed the deep meaning behind Shannon's words. She laughed lightly and set down her empty teacup. It seems those things buried in your eyes aren't black pebbles anymore. How is it? Do you see how it feels for furniture to be reborn as a human? Yes. I never knew the world was this kind. Since the start of our relationship with George, Shannon's face had grown brighter more often. Her smile had made everything go smoothly and it even changed her fortune. Shannon made less mistakes in her work than she had before, and the family member's opinion of her was slowly starting to change. Just the other day, she had been surprised when Kraus, who rarely exchanged words with her, had suddenly started talking to her. You've been wearing a splendid smile more often lately, haven't you? Has something good happened? No, but every day is fun, yes. Hmm. Wonderful. It goes without saying that coffee is more delicious when poured with a smile. Could I ask for that smile once more? Y yes, sir. That had become a chance for Shannon to gain confidence in herself. Of course, it didn't go beyond her own heart, and it wasn't so big a change that anyone would notice. But she had begun to change, bit by bit. Shannon understood it clearly. Knowing love was the same as gaining a soul. The same as being reborn, from furniture to a human. There was absolutely nothing mistaken in Beatrice's words. By knowing love, Shannon had learned what it was to be human. These have been unusual snacks. It was time well spent. It's probably about time for you to return to your work, so let us end our tea party now. After all, it seems a certain person doesn't like seeing us drink tea together. See, not all tea parties are bad! Huh? The witch gripped a teaspoon and flipped it with her fingers, sending it up in the air.
After that, it was launched by the fingers of some invisible person. It flew straight into a nearby bush. Of course, Cannon! He's like, fuck you! The bush shook violently, and Cannon came out. It seemed he had been there for some time, watching their tea party. The spoon was gripped in his hand. Oh, he probably w was sent to go get her. Caught them. In and out. Uh-oh. Papiana caught it in an instant and might have hit him hard on the forehead. It caused him to start oozing blood. I don't know if a teaspoon could really do that, but okay. Mm. Do not worry. Our tea party is over now, Cannon. How long were you there? If you had called to us, I'd have poured you some tea, too. I imagine that you didn't want to interrupt a pair of women talking, right? <laughs> Cannon kept silent, but there seemed to be a slightly hostile look in his eyes. On the outside, he acted with respect. But unlike Shannon, Cannon did not trust the witch. When Beatrice hit the table with her pipe, the tea set turned into gold butterflies, which flew upwards all at once. They then scattered in every direction, and the cleanup was already done. It was fun, Shannon. Let us meet again if the chance arises. My magical power is still quite lacking. It's tiring even to show myself. If you're that tired, never appear again. Cannon had said it in a small voice, but the witch seemed to have heard it perfectly. She giggled, but did not reply. Shannon... Tell me more about George at our next tea party. There are no snacks sweeter than a person's love life. <laughs> See you again. Beatrice's body also became gold butterflies, which scattered in all directions and disappeared. It was a fantastical and beautiful scene, like a blizzard of gold leaf. For a while, Shannon quietly watched the witches exit. Cannon approached her from behind and spoke with an expression that was drastically different from hers. Nissan, didn't I tell you to stay away from her? Beatrice Sama isn't that bad of a person. Yes, she might be a little shady, but... The fact that only we can see her is suspicious enough. The thing isn't human. Who knows what she might be planning? Cannon Coon, I think that's a little rude. There was a touch of sternness in Shannon's voice, which was unusual for her. To Cannon, who knew her well, she must have sounded extremely stern. Cannon, looking excessively surprised considering Shannon's tone, fell silent. It's true that Beatrice Sama is different from humans. She has a terrifying power, so I think it's right for us to fear and respect her. Still, I think it's incredibly rude to despise her just because she is inhuman. I understand what you're trying to say, Neat Nason. You've changed ever since she gave you that brooch. It's like you're her prisoner. She brought you and George Sama together, and now you're indebted to her. Don't say things like that. That thing isn't human. We don't know what she's thinking. So you mustn't trust her. And we aren't humans either, Nissan. Cannon's words grew more serious. Those words probably gouged at Shannon's heart. She bit her lower lip and hung her head. Oh, you know, I just remembered. Okay, so I know they keep saying this and you're probably confused. Like, what the fuck is this? But episode two is where they... Eventually, you're going to see what they're talking about. Just for, just so you know. We are furniture. Even if we receive names and are treated as humans, that won't change the manner of our birth. You are no longer furniture. Those words Beatrice had given her, which had made her happiest, floated through student Shannon's mind. I am not furniture. No, you are furniture. We are less than human. Nason, you're just pretending to have forgotten. Pretending to be human. You know that as well as I do. I am not furniture. I'm human. No, you aren't. We have never possessed what it takes to love or be loved. 
Cannon's criticism seemed to have shifted away from Shannon's meetings with the witch. Shannon picked up on that quickly. I heard from a lady. Seriously, what were you thinking? I can't believe you would go on a trip with George Sama. You've forgotten your place's furniture. You've just been tempted by that witch, mistakenly believing that you've become human. Listen, Cannon Koo. It's true that we're furniture. Lesser beings, inferior to humans. But if it were possible to make up for what we lack, wouldn't that be the same as becoming human? Such a thing could never happen. No, it could. If we can do that, we won't be furniture anymore. We can become human. Ridiculous. As if you could ever do such a thing. Cannon spat those words out, but did so weakly and turned away. He was probably giving up. After all the suffering they had undergone during those days he lived as furniture, his heart was firmly sealed. You can do it too, Cannon Coon. You can become a normal human. Stop it, that's a witch talking. Yes, Beatrice Sama taught me. By obtaining the single element of this world, we can become human. Or rather, nobody's human if they don't have that. That's why people spend their entire lives trying to gain that single element. I don't understand what you're saying, Mesa. I don't want to listen to ranting. Then I'll teach it in a way even you can understand. Look, see what I'm pointing at? Shannon quietly pointed at the sea, towards the horizon. Cannon didn't understand what she meant. It couldn't do anything except look between the horizon and Shannon's expression, which seemed to be posing a riddle. The sea. Cannon Coon, what color does the sea look like to you? It was an extremely simple question. For a while, Cannon tried to guess at the meaning behind it, but he couldn't think of anything, so he answered obediently. It's a hazy, dark gray color. So what? Objectively speaking, the sea, laid out beneath the cloudy sky, could probably be described best by Cannon's words. But as Shannon closed her eyes and smiled, she shook her head slightly. It looks deep blue to me. Is that what you mean? Like how Japanese people use the word blue to refer to a green traffic light? No. The sea is a deep blue. If I understand and you don't, then that's the difference between us. Cannon bit his lower lip and was silent for a while. I don't understand. Cannon could. Would you stick out your hand? As Cannon was taken aback, unable to understand what she was saying, she took his arm and opened the palm of his hand. Shannon softly said something there. It was that magic brooch which she had received from Beatrice. A magic charm shaped like a gold butterfly that could bring love to fruition. This is... hers? No, this is mine. So think of it as me and treat it with respect, okay? After being spoken to like that, he could have just thrown it away. Kenna didn't know what he should do and he stood there confused for a while, the brooch still on the palm of his hand. Shannon put the palm of her hand on top of Cannon's, and the brooch was worn by both of their hands. This charm holds true magical power. I'm sure it'll teach you an important emotion, Cannon Coon. There's nothing to be learned from that person's magic. No, there is something. So wear it. If that's embarrassing, I hear it's okay if you just hide it in your pocket. Ridiculous. As if I'd let the magic of that person lead me astray. Even as he said that, Cannon couldn't be cold-hearted towards something Shannon was urging him to take. In the end, Cannon took it and agreed reluctantly, saying he'd prove that he wouldn't surrender to the witch's power. Shannon smiled and nodded back. I'm sure you'll be able to learn something important from it, and I'm sure you can become human. And when you do, I'm sure this ocean will look like a beautiful blue to you as well, Cannon Goon. Gray is gray no matter how many times you look. That's Ron, Cannon Coon. It only looks like that because you have no... 
Paula. Because of the howling wind, he hadn't been able to catch the main point of what she had just said. So Shannon said it once more. Single element of the world. She spoke once more of the world where it existed and where the sea was deep blue. I'm sure you'll be able to see a deep blue ocean too. After all, without love, it cannot be seen. I just saw this. Yep, T. Ding, ding, ding. T is right. T is right. It is. It's love. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's love. Or did I think it was... Did I think it was love and then she said it was something else? I think it's love. I'm pretty sure it's love. Because the man she mentioned in the last chapter was Jesus. And, yeah. <laughs> Jesus was all about that. Love! Love thy neighbor! Oh god. Oh, the Kinzo voice. I haven't been Kinzo in- Oh my god! I haven't done his voice since the beginning of this shit! Okay, ahem. Old, crazy, fucking man. Abusive asshole. <laughs> <clears throat> Who was that? It is canon, Master. It was rare for Kinzo to leave his study. However, the fact that he had didn't mean his noble research had been suspended. He may have left the study because of a change in mood, but that didn't mean the thoughts filling his head were any different from those he had while inside the study. Cannon knew that no matter what the time, speaking to Kinzo when he didn't want to be spoken to would always disturb his research. It's cloudy out there. Will it get worse? Yes. According to the weather report, it could rain at any time. Shall I bring an umbrella? It will not come to that. Leave me alone for a while. My children, ask say that you do not know where I am. I am busy on a journey through my own thoughts. I have no idea that- I don't think that's what I did before. I apologize <laughs> if his voice is all over the place. It's just been a really long-ass time. <laughs> Certainly. Then, if you would excuse me. Before Cannon finished bowing, Kinzo had already returned to his own world, having forgotten Cannon's presence completely. But once again, he began rambling to himself, amidst those words, the name of that which popped up many times. Oh, Beatrice, my hand will not reach your smile. What could I do to revive you? What could I do to make you smile at me once more? What is lacking? My research, my materials, my catalyst. Where's that magical power, or luck, or an oracle? Oh, Beatrice, what can I do to see your face one more time? Oh. As Cannon listened to his master's weeping voice with his back turned, he turned around just once. When he did, right beside his eyes, right behind his isolated old master, was a shadow of a person who shouldn't have been there. It was the witch. At once, thinking that the witch must be plotting to do Kinzo some harm, Kinnon dashed back to Kinzo and tried to form a shield with his body. But when he saw the expression on the witch's face, that emotion of his vanished. After all, Beatrice, Beatrice's expression was sorrowful, or maybe pitying. You fool, Kinzo. Can't you see me, even though I am here? Right behind Kinzo, as he repeated the witch's name over and over, desiring to be reunited with her more than anything else, was the witch herself. Dude, that's so fucking sad, though. Like, ah. Uh. And yet, Kinzo didn't notice anything. When Beatrice tried to rest her hand on his shoulder, he didn't notice. See, 
Honestly, not gonna lie, I would love to do a um, couple's cosplay. Like, convince Bruce to be, to like, cosplay as Kinzo, and then be Beatrice. Just cause, I don't know, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Why? Why does my head not reach Beatrice's smile? Is it the age of the moon? The cycle of the comets? The alignment of the planets? What is lacking? What is? What is? It's useless, Kinzo. Without love, you cannot be seen. Cannon took the brooch, the brooch he had received from Shannon out of his pocket. By learning something new, would he be able to would he become able to glimpse something he couldn't see now? Without love, it cannot be seen. He looked at Kinzo's back once more. The witch could no longer be seen there. That is the end of that chapter. So we got to, we got to get a little more, a little bit of a glimpse into um, Beatrice's past a little bit, and Canon is kind of very, very slowly warming up to the idea of magic being useful, so we'll kind of see how that goes. Also, it's interesting that, hey, we aren't on the island anymore. But, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and save here. Oh, wow, okay. This is new. Um. It's just Jessica now. Huh. Alright. Well, thank you guys for watching. Um. Go ahead and give a like, uh, comment what you think the single element of the world is. I mean, I might be wrong, it has a completely, you know, uh, confirmed that love is a single element, so if you think it's something else, go ahead and leave that in the comments. Uh, give me a subscribe. If you'd like to watch me narrate this live, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash insanityisgood. Uh, Lowest tier gets access to the Discord server. It's very cheap. Um, and you get to talk to me and the rest of the Insana fam. And you can watch some of my streams and stuff live. So, I mean, it was kind of a... Well, this what I do it in real time. It's a bit of an exclusive thing, so. Anyways, I hope you guys are staying safe. Hang in there. Hopefully, the closer we get to the new year, things will get better. Uh, Alright, guys. Have a good night.